Okay, welcome to part 10 of my series looking at Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the textbooks. I'll get started here. Uh, by the way, I, um, I'd um i sent a PM to Russ Miller, uh, letting him know that the series was going on. As I, I'd, I'd written him a couple of times before, letting him know that I was working on it. And I let him know that the first five parts were out, and he was kind enough to respond. Um, I just thought it... You know, just to let you know, this is, what he, this is what he said to me. Thanks for letting me know about your videos. I watched the first five minutes and found it a complete waste of five minutes. <laughs> oh, my, my, my work here is done. And this evolutionist wrote, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. Love how he has to tack on evolutionist um, to all of these people. It's really hilarious. Like it, it's somehow adding credibility to the bullshit he's spewing by saying it, even an evolutionist agrees with me. Uh, Pierre Paul Grasse was not an evolutionist in the Darwinian sense at all. In fact, he was uh, probably the last of the great Lamarckists, um, uh, who, you know, who believed that change accumulated during an organism's lifetime uh, then is propagated into their offspring. A long discredited by the majority of scientists held on by a few uh, in, especially in the 70s uh, France especially a, a number of biologists in France held on to Lamarckism. Uh, I don't know that any still do. Um, again, a lot of these ideas were discredited. It's just funny. It's a funny thing to bring up. This evolutionists who realized Darwinism was just simply inaccurate stated mutations are always weaker well gene depletion they lose information and in free competition that's in nature they are eliminated well what what eliminates the weaker ones in nature natural selection natural selection doesn't cause evolution natural selection prevents evolution from being possible <laughs> God, you're such a douchebag. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Herbert Nielsen. It's Her Herbert, by the way, not Herbert, but that's all right. Uh, I see the names often, often, I guess it's anglicized. I don't know. Um, Herbert Nielsen. Uh, you call him a famed evolutionist. I think that's fucking hilarious. Famed evolutionist. Because you know what he's famous for? Um, first of all, his really great claim to fame is that he's quoted by creationists repeatedly. Uh, that's his real big claim to fame. Um, in fact, if it wasn't for creationists, I doubt you would find anybody in the sciences that had even heard of this guy, okay? Um, he was a rather obscure professor of botany in Sweden. Um, he's sometimes falsely attributed as being director of the Swedish Botanical Institute, which doesn't exist. Um, but nonetheless, what's really hilarious is is that not only was he not famous, um, I, it, he, he would be the strangest kind of evolutionist that I've ever heard of because he didn't fucking believe in evolution. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't accept evolution at all. He didn't accept creationism. He accepted this idea called emication, which is really interesting. Um, this idea holds that species are fixed, um, that all the whole biosphere of the planet is fixed, fixed ecological niches and everything like that, right? However, every few million years, a sudden catastrophic event occurs, like a, you know, explosion in the sun or something, that kills all life on the planet off. All life goes extinct at the same time. Earth is sterilized. Um, however, the genetic material from all of the things alive um, uh, decay, turn to dust, float around in the atmosphere, combine together, forming new life from all the little bits and pieces of DNA, and suddenly abiogenesis starts again, and the whole Earth is repopulated with rearranged DNA from the creatures that existed before. Now that sounds like a really freaking crazy idea, and it, it, it is absolutely, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it certainly doesn't have a lot of followers in science, if, if any. I've never heard of anybody anybody that holds to this idea outside of Herbert Nilsson. Um, so it's just funny to quote famed Swedish evolutionist. <laughs> you guys are fucking stupid. And this is how you can destroy Darwinism in seven seconds flat. Start your timer. 
The DNA code barrier plus gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism scientifically impossible. Stop the clock. That's all it takes. That's right. Seven seconds to destroy Darwinism. Um, that is, if you're debating, I don't know, a retarded chimpanzee, maybe. Let's see, because of your, your, your three points that prove Darwin to be false. Uh, the first one, DNA code barrier doesn't exist, has never been shown to exist. So right there, we throw out part, point number one. Your second point, gene depletion, which you, by which you mean allelic depletion, not gene depletion again. Um, it simply is not a problem for Darwinism because we know that new alleles can be added. And your third point, natural selection. Natural selection disproves Darwinism. That's kind of funny that something that, oh, I don't know, is the central tenet of a theory is what disproves it. You're talking out of your ass. Sir Fred Hoyle stated, be suspicious of a theory if more and more hypotheses are needed to support it as new facts become available. This is exactly what has happened to Darwin's theory. Rather than getting rid of the fail theory like you would do in real science, they keep propping it up with excuses and false proofs. You're quite the quote mining slut, aren't you there, Russ? Uh, <laughs> that, that, you think Hoyle supports your viewpoint? Do you think Hoyle was a young earth creationist, um, you know, supporting a biblical creation? You know, um, I mean... I, Hoyle is, he's, creationists love to quote Hoyle, um, because he says a lot of things that seemingly support their cause, um, except for the fact that, uh, Fred Hoyle believed that the universe was eternal, um, meaning that it had been around eternally for trillions and upon trillions upon trillions of years, um, so when he does these, cal what, he's famous for calculating the odds of something evolving being so remote, um, he believed it evolved, um, his point of pointing out the odds of it evolving being so remote are saying that, see, the universe has to be trillions of years old for this to have occurred. Um, but the really funny thing is, is that Hoyle believed that um, instead of Darwinian evolution, he believed that aliens came to Earth and genetically created life. Okay, so tell me, you support Hoyle's view on that there, Russ? An intelligent biblical designer put a wide range of variation in his created kind's gene pools so they could survive in various climates and conditions. That's the reason one dog can live outside in Nome, Alaska throughout the winter. The other can live outside in Phoenix, Arizona throughout the summer. They have adapted through the information they had in their original created gene pools. But they've lost so much information in their adaptational past that if you switch them, they would both die. I'm not going to go into this again. This is the uh, same idea, the same mistaken view that, that, that the creator gave this basically giant genome to everything um, with all of the variability they could ever possibly want and use. And then um, subsequently that's been, as adaption occurs, that, that traits have been lost, but nothing new has been added. Um, again, you would have to look at a, a the ancestral genome. You'd have to look at a wolf genome and, and show uh, where are the genes you know, where, where are the genes for a wiener dog in a wolf? They're not there. Have you ever been told that you are 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? They like to throw that around quite a bit, don't they? Actually, studies have this closer down to about 92% now, and as real science gets into the genome, that's going to widen and widen. Once again, you're talking out of your ass, Russ. What do you mean that the, the, the difference is going to widen as we get further into the genome? How much further into the genome do we need to go? We've sequenced the chimp genome, and we've sequenced the human genome, and we know the similarity. Um, again, this, there, there's a lot of different ways you can compare a genome. Um, you don't just side-by-side -side compare them, but looking at it in sort of a standardized way, uh, chimps are about 99% similar to humans now. Um, the gap hasn't widened. The gap has gotten smaller as we've learned more information. But if similar biochemistry is proof for evolution, why don't they say we evolved from mice? Did you know your biochemistry is 96% the same as that from a mouse? 96% similar to a mouse? Where did you get that from, Russ? Uh, because... It's full of shit. Um, according to the Human Genome Project, uh, looking at a standardized comparison between genomes, the mouse genome is 
uh, 75% similar to a human genome. Now, if we're looking at orthologous gene sequences, um, the average is about 85%, but nowhere near 96%, you're talking shit. In fact, did you know your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana? Anyone evolved from a banana? Last time I was at a college and I asked that question, 450 students raised their hand. Kind of scared me. I think they were serious. And uh, by the way, 50% similar to a banana? Uh, you're really dragging out all of the old Kent Hovind lies, aren't you? Genetic similarity is proof of an intelligent common designer. It has nothing to do with Darwinian change. For instance, human cytochrome C is closest to that from a sunflower, yet they don't claim we evolved from sunflowers. Do you bother to fact check anything you say? Or do you really just don't give a shit less how accurate you are? So, based on cytochrome C, a human's closest relative should be the sunflower? I'd like to know where you're basing that on. Actually, I know where you got it from. You lifted it from Kent Hovind. Um, that is actually right from a Kent Hovind seminar, as is the remainder of what you're going to get into. Um, problem is with it, Kent Hovind lied about it. It's simply, it wasn't, it wasn't a mistake. He lied. Um, the sequence was known when he's made the seminar. The sequence has been known for decades. We know the chimpanzee cytochrome sequence. We know the human cytochrome sequence. We know the sunflower cytochrome sequence. And, uh, the reality is, uh, I'm going to put a link down below to a website where the author was kind enough to give you the sequences of cytochrome C from a sunflower and a human and a chimp and a rabbit and a mouse and whatever, a wide variety of different organisms. So you yourself can cross compare them. And I did. I cut and pasted the cytochrome sequence from a sunflower and I, um, right underneath it, I cut and pasted the cytochrome sequence from a human to compare. Uh, first of all, um, the human cytochrome C sequence is 155 amino acids long, while the, the sunflower is 111 amino acids long. Um, but do you know how much overlap there were? you know how, much, how many sequences they had in common? Total? Six amino acids. Six amino acids were in the same, the same amino acid in the same position in the sequence. That's, abs, that's it. Um, so I did the same thing with the chimpanzee cytochrome C. And you know what? They're actually, they're actually remarkably similar. Um, actually, they're identical. Letter for letter, across the board, all 155 amino acids are exactly the same amino acid in exactly the same position in the chimpanzee cytochrome C. I don't think you can get much closer than that. In fact, human and chimp cytochrome C um, is as close as any two things could possibly be. Human eyes are closest to that from the octopus. Human skin is closest to that from pigs. Our hemoglobin structure is closest to that from root nodules. Human lysosome is closest to that from chickens. Human milk is closest to that from donkeys. On and on we could go. We have to have similar biochemistry with other plants and animals or we wouldn't be able to eat anything except other people. An octopus's eye is exactly the same as a human eye or closest to a human eye? Uh, you know that's full of shit, right? Uh, <laughs> if you've ever dissected an octopus or it's looked at the anatomy of an octopus eye, it's a whole different arrangement than any vertebrate eye. Uh, vertebrates all have a very specific type of eye. Um, remember the retina in the back and all that kind of crap you know, that creationists like to get into as well. Um, so that actually contradicts a lot of other... In fact, it contradicts something else that Kent Hovind said, but that's that's all an aside. Um, the octopus's eye is not at all like a human's eye. Now, they have very good eyes. They have very good vision and such. Um, it's very complex. It's as complicated as a human eye, um, but it's not the same eye. And as for the rest of this, that's just, a, it's again, right from Ken Hovind's seminar, and it's all full of shit, okay? None of it holds true whatsoever. I, I'm just, a, it's amazing to me that they can say it in front of an audience and not have the audience get out and walk out and going, this guy is a fucking idiot.